Good morning, everyone. And is there a teenager here to help me figure this out? Uh, I'm going to chat. Um, could someone from staff please chat Kevin about trying some different things, getting his speakers working for us? And while staff does that, um, if we could just get started with our Tuesday, October 19th Regional Transportation Committee meeting. I'm um, Dr. Cog Board Chair Ashley Stoltzman, and I'm calling the meeting to order. So first up, um, we will take attendance by the panelists uh, list on the side here, and we'll look for any public comment this morning. Are there any members of the public that would care to comment? All right, seeing none, that takes us over to our meeting summary. Any questions or comments on our RTC meeting summary from September 16th, 2021? Seeing no hands, then we'll accept the meeting summary. And that takes us to our action item. So first up, we'll have Josh, uh, our assistant planner. And in, you'll find in attachment B, um, information about some TIP amendments. And so he'll take us through that this morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so we do have two proposed uh, TIP policy amendments for RTC's consideration this morning. The first is a series of changes to the Region 1 Faster Pool uh, related to recent SB 260 awards. Uh, this includes adding four new pool projects, adjusting the cost and limits on five existing pool projects, and removing four completed pool projects. Uh, there is also an increase of uh, state funding of $8,984,000 to this pool. The second amendment is to the Region 4 2013 flood-related projects pool, and that is uh, simply to increase the funding to the pool by $6 million uh, due to uh, additional repairs on State Highway 7. Um, so I do have a proposed motion available in your packet and on your screen, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for that. Any discussion from members? Any questions or comments? Um, you can use your hand raise feature that you'll find at the bottom of the screen. There's a little button you can click that says raise hand if you have comments or emotions or questions. Director Peck. If you could unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to recommend to the board the attached amendments to the 2022-2025 Transportation Improvement Program. Thank you, Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I second that motion. Thank you. Any discussion of the motion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please unmute yourself and say aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you, everyone. That takes us to our next topic this morning, which is the draft regional complete streets toolkit. Jacob Rieger, our manager of long range transportation planning will take us through that and you'll find it in your packet as attachment C. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Give me just a moment to share my screen. Okay, hopefully everyone can see the presentation and hear me. Um, so we gave you a briefing on what we're calling the Regional Complete Streets Toolkit back at your August meeting. And at that time, it was a draft toolkit. Uh, we had started our public comment period. Um, so now we kind of want to put a bow on this, uh, tell you a little bit more about the Complete Streets Toolkit and what we heard during the public comment period. Um, and then we have a motion for you as well. Uh, with me today to help do this presentation is our consultant, Trung Bo of Tool Design Group. So Trung, take it away. Thank you, Jacob. So the Regional Complete Streets Toolkit is trying to accomplish a couple of different things. It's fairly aspirational, but also grounded in reality. And the intent is that the toolkit is going to advance complete streets. That's sort of the overall umbrella. That's what we're trying to do um, as, as a, a region um, and as local governments to implement complete streets across the region so that eventually and ultimately we're gonna have a network of complete, street, complete streets across the, the, the Denver region. Uh, sort of more uh, 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 in terms of what we're trying to do with the toolkit and, and what that means for uh, a couple of uh, uh, sort of concrete action items. The toolkit is really intended to support 2050 uh, Metro Vision RTP and already uh, some of the, the uh, components of the toolkit have made it into the 2050 Metro Vision RTP. Um, the toolkit is also intended to be a, a really robust resource for local governments, especially for local governments that, that maybe don't have the internal resources or don't have the internal um, policies or, or guidance documents uh, right, uh, 
already uh, available to them. So the toolkit's really going to be um, going to be sort of that that resource for them to to use to advance complete streets. And then finally, um, of course, as as Dr. Cog is a convener of um, local governments and partners to um, advance uh, transportation projects and, and, and others, complete streets are going to be um, really the one of the, the big focal points and um, getting getting uh, local governments and partners to collaborate and coordinate is very, very important and a primary goal of the toolkit. So on the next slide, um, I've already said that a number of these things, but um, you can kind of see here that the toolkit is, is trying to accomplish a lot of things and, and it's gonna take a, a lot of effort uh, and coordination and collaboration, creativity, funding, time, resources to, to make complete streets a reality. So the toolkit includes uh, tools to, to be able to, to get to that, that reality. Uh, moving on to the next slide here, I want to um, quickly present uh, the, the street typology that we developed as a part of the toolkit. Um, when we think about complete streets, uh, functional classification, the, the sort of traditional arterials and collectors and local streets, that can only get us so far because it's, it's maybe too separate from, um, from land use and, and other, uh, other important context, um, context characteristics. And so the complete streets street typology is really intended to be a lot more sensitive to land use, a lot more sensitive to expected growth and development. And so on screen here, you can see 10 different street types that comprise the street typology. Um, and uh, what we did was we, we took a look at every single um, arterial and collector uh, in the Denver region, the, the totaling about 5,000 miles. So there was an automated process to assign these street types. Um, and then there was a manual process to check every single street and make sure that, um, that the, the street types were assigned in a way that was respectful of what's currently there, but also aspirational thinking about what can happen in the future um, and what, what a complete street might look like in the future. I do wanna point out um, street types num numbers eight, nine, and 10. We were really, really intentional about making sure that um, that we provided flexibility and just knowing the diversity of, um, of the Denver region, the different types of communities, the different different types of geography, we wanted to make sure that we were not just focusing on uh, built out areas, but also on rural and, and mountainous areas of the Dr. Card region. So then moving on, I think at this point, I'm going to hand it to Jacob to talk about the story map. Yeah, thanks, Trung. So one of the one of the important pieces that we developed as part of the Complete Streets Toolkit, again, knowing that it is a toolkit and it has data, information, resources, and things to help um, project sponsors, local governments, and others um, in terms of understanding and implementing complete streets, we developed something called a regional complete street story map. And this is the first time we've ever done this at Dr. Cog. Um, this is not actually part of your approval today. This is something that we did on the side, um, but I do want to make you aware that it's available and that it's a resource. So hopefully you can see this as I pull it up. I'm gonna go through this just really, really quickly. There's a lot of data and information in here, but I just wanna give you a flavor of it. A story map is something that combines photos, text, graphics, maps, other elements in a kind of um, sort of interactive way, as you see, as I scroll through, um, to really sort of bring this to life and help people understand both the Complete Streets Toolkit, um, but also in particular, as this map loads the street typologies, uh, folks can actually um, you know, click on this and sort of interact with it, you know, for your own community. Um, you can understand the street typologies. As I scroll through, you see on the left side of the screen that each one is explained, um, and then you can tie them together to what's on the map uh, for any area that you're interested in. So I'll just scroll through here really quickly. Um, and again, it talks more about the Complete Streets Toolkit and how it works for implementation. And then at the bottom here, um, links, to, um, links to other resources. Um, again, given that this is a toolkit, we want to make this as interactive and as user friendly as possible. So let me come back to the presentation. Um, so for just a little bit more on the on what's in the toolkit, let me turn it back to Trung. Thanks, Jacob. So as you can probably tell, we're starting from, from pretty high up and then we're getting closer and closer to the ground, right? Um, and so we, we started with this umbrella of complete streets. Uh, we talked about the street typology, which is across the region. Um, now we wanna talk a little bit about the guidance that's available for every single street type and then every single design element that might be associated with that street type. And so in the toolkit itself, chapter two is basically the street typology and then graphics and guidance um, 
in modal priorities around what each of these street types um, should be prioritizing, right? So for example, this downtown commercial streets, the modal priorities are, are really um, emphasizing people walking, people bicycling, using transit. Um, freight and deliveries is, is a medium priority. And then relatively speaking, um, uh, motor vehicle travel is, is a low priority. But then on the right side, you can also see all of these. It's basically a menu of design elements that are available um, for uh, implementation or inclusion in the, the planning and the design of a street that might be assigned a downtown commercial street. And then on the left side of the image is just an illustrative graphic of what it might look like. It's really intended to communicate sort of this, this look and feel of what the street type is. It's not representative of all different um, downtown commercial streets, right? There are lots of different iterations of, of what a downtown commercial street might look like. So the, the really great thing about this kind of chapter two of the toolkit is that it's connected to chapter three. So on the next slide, we're just showing a couple of pages from chapter three, um, indicating and in, in, um, presenting uh, guidance for each of these design elements. And so for downtown commercial streets, perhaps bicycle micro mobility is a really high priority. And so what does that mean for the planner and designer? Uh, if they're looking at a street project and it's a downtown commercial street, and, and they want to include some kind of uh, bikeway or, or space for micro mobility. What does it actually look like? This is just an example of, of connecting chapters, chapters two and three, basically street typology to the design elements. And chapter three with all of the design elements is broken up in a pretty log um, logical uh, num number of buckets. And so it, it uh, includes um, design elements that are specific to the pedestrian realm, to uh, just general roadway design elements, um, uh, bikeways and micro mobility, transit, intersections and crossings, uh, which are pretty pretty inclusive of, of all the modes, but they're they're uh, pretty it's it's unique, and so we provide a separate section for that. Um, the curbside elements, as well as uh, landscaping, so that includes green infrastructure um, and um, and stormwater as well. So then on the next slide, I think I'm going to hand it back to Jacob to talk about the steering committee engagement um, and then um, the public engagement as well. Yeah, thank you, Trum. So as I mentioned, uh, we had both a steering committee uh, sort of review of the draft complete streets toolkit, as well as a public comment period. Uh, throughout the project, we had a steering committee that met several times that was comprised of uh, primarily local government members, uh, CDOT, RTD, um, other stakeholders involved in this process. Um, as we got the toolkit together, they had a two week review period at the end of July. Um, and then we went into a public comment period from mid August through mid September. Um, as the slide says, we got over 100 distinct comments uh, through the public comment period. I'm always cautious about sort of uh, summarizing public comment because I don't want to I don't want to over characterize or mischaracterize uh, the kind of comments that we received in the public comment period. One of the attachments to this memo is a comments matrix where we have um, to be transparent, we have showed every comment that we've received um, and then how we've responded to that comment, um, both, you know, sort of a narrative response to the comment, um, as well as whether that comment triggered changes to the document. So if you're interested, I do encourage you to take a look at that. But at the highest level, I would characterize the comments we received as supportive of the toolkit. Um, but we did get many sort of technical comments. Again, it's a very technical document, um, as you can tell. So we got many very specific technical comments and suggestions that we tried to incorporate um, in the revised draft final document. And then with that um, proposed motion on the screen, I do wanna end with a few thank yous. As you can tell, this is a very complex uh, project. It takes a lot of folks to put this together. Um, so I do wanna thank our steering committee. Um, again, really all of our local governments, CDOT, RTD, uh, the agencies here today, um, a lot of Dr. Cog's staff and several divisions at Dr. Cog, both on the toolkit and the story map, as you can tell, uh, that was our first ever story map. Um, and then I also wanna thank our consultant tool design group in Trung. Uh, for their work as well. So really a lot of folks involved in this uh, really appreciate the collaboration. Uh, we're asking you to recommend um, that the board uh, adopt the draft regional complete streets toolkit. And with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for that great presentation. Anyone have questions or motions to put on the table? Director Shaw. Thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, I had one question and trying to understand why local streets and what was it limited access uh, highways were not labeled. I I get that we might not want to do anything with them, but was that the reason? <laughs> uh, Mr. Rieger. Um, actually, Trung, do you want to field that one? 
Yeah, certainly. And thank you for the question. Um, so there are a couple of different reasons. The, the primary one being um, just think about the scope of the entire region. And so as I mentioned, the the uh, the arterials and collectors data set that we were working with um, totaled almost 5,000 miles or just just around 5,000 miles. For the, so for this effort, we were really just focusing on the project or the streets where um, there might be projects that are more likely to um, request statewide or federal funding. So for the local streets, there's just so much different variation in the likelihood of complete streets project being um, funded and implemented on a local street. It, it's more likely that that would happen via uh, local funding. So that's really the, the, the two primary reasons around, it's, it's basically defining sort of what can we do with this effort, but then number two, also maximizing return on investment. You know, what kind of guidance can we provide for local governments that's gonna be the most helpful right now? Sure. No, that makes sense. Thank you. I, I would move to recommend the board adopt the draft Regional Complete Streets Toolkit. Thank you. <clears throat> and um, Mr. Stanton, Director Stanton. Uh, thank you, Chair. I will uh, second that, but I would also like to thank Trung and Jacob for excellent brief. One uh, technical question, Trung, you mentioned rural roads and here in Jefferson County, we have a very great part of unincorporated. I'm wondering how this, this seems to be more headed towards urban streets, et cetera, but how would the toolkit help those who are trying to reach urban road, make them more usable? Absolutely. Rural roads. So, so I, I can respond uh, pr pretty quickly to that. Thank you for the question. Um, so, so the toolkit where we're we're trying, we, we understand, we understand that the rural roads and especially the mountainous roads um, are very, very challenging, right? When you've got a river on one side and a rock face on the other, what can you really do to make that a complete street? And so what we, what we, what we the, the line that we tried to, to, to skirt in the toolkit is we want to encourage local governments, um, Jefferson County and, and others to, to be really thoughtful about how to provide a connected complete streets network eventually, knowing that there are some severe constraints um, in, in the, the short term. So um, there's a lot of flexibility that the toolkit provides, um, but if we're going to want to accommodate um, uh, multimodalism, biking, walking, and transit on rural roads or mountainous roads, uh, then there's a lot more to, to have a conversation around. Uh, are we expecting new development? Are we seeing a lot of folks uh, walking and biking today? Is, is there a safety issue? Um, so it's 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 not quite as simple as um, the toolkit assigns um, uh, these streets with these design elements. It's really more, hey, let's have the conversation and uh, accomplish this, this vision together as a collective. Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned safety because a lot of these roads have a real safety problem. Absolutely. Yeah, and Commissioner Stan, I'd say that we actually included mountain and rural roads in part for that very purpose. You know, given the multimodal activities that happen on those roads, we wanted to make that part of the universe of the Complete Streets Toolkit. Thank you. Thank you for that <clears throat> great point, Director Stanton. My sister <clears throat> lives right off of North Turkey Creek, <clears throat> and there's definitely an opportunity to improve safety in some of those winding areas. Uh, Executive Director Rex. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ruka, I also wanted to thank our regional staff and our Dr. Cog staff and our consulting team on, on the work. I, I, uh, I really enjoyed this read. I, I kind of nerd out on this type of stuff. I am a planner by trade. So I, I really did appreciate the, the, the level of detail that's included in the document. Um, you know, this is, this is a pretty mature field, right? I mean, this is complete streets have been around for a long time and there's areas within our region, so communities that have fully implemented this concept, right? Which is fantastic and hopeful, I think with, uh, with kind of a reintroduction to the, the, the idea within our region that it might be an impetus for um, some of our other communities to, to kind of jump on and, and utilize this toolkit. So I'm really excited about this, especially as we head into greenhouse gas emission rulemaking. Um, I would suggest to you that some of the concepts discussed in this report would would um, probably ra raise to the level of some of mitigation strategies. So, um, so yeah, it's a it's a very important document at a very important time. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for that. <clears throat> and so there's a motion and a second on the table. Any further discussion from members? All right, seeing none, if you could please unmute yourself and all in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. And so our next presentation this morning is also from Director Rieger, our manager in long range transportation planning, and it's about the Transportation Advisory Committee for a special interest seat. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we'll pull up the staff memo here. Uh, no presentation on this one, um, but this concerns one of our, what we call our special interest seats on our Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, so you may remember, I think a couple months ago, we did the annual review of TEC membership uh, with RTC. And at that time, um, one of RTC's roles is actually to confirm and reconfirm uh, the representatives that we have on the seven special interest seats for the Transportation Advisory Committee. These are subject matter experts in fields that are uh, closely related to transportation that help the Transportation Advisory Committee um, do its work. Since that annual review that we did with you a couple of months ago, we've had a vacancy on the freight seat. Um, and when we have a vacancy on one of these special interest seats, our standard procedure is to do sort of a solicitation, a competitive sort of solicitation of applications for folks to fill the seat. Uh, we did that. Uh, we've got a great candidate that we're recommending to you today to fill the freight seat. Um, his name is Walter Weird. Um, he's a gentleman that has I know something like 40 years of experience in um, transportation, logistics, and freight. Um, he's got a very deep background in this. Um, we think he would make a good candidate um, for the freight, uh, for the freight seat on TAC. So really this item today is just to ask you to um, uh, recommending that you approve uh, Mr. Weird as the freight representative on Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Any discussion from members? Director Cook. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd move to confirm the appointment of Walter Wirt as the freight special interest member in the Transportation Advisory Committee. Know him personally and familiar with his background and think he'll be a great addition. Thank you, Director Cook. Is there a second? Director Peck? I second that. Thank you, Director Peck. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, everyone. So our next topic this morning is an informational brief briefing from Robert Spots, our program manager in mobility analytics. You'll find it in attachment E, and you're going to want to click on attachment E because there's just a lot of really interesting data and analysis that was done here. So we're in for a real treat, and we'll have a presentation now on the 2020 annual congestion report. Robert, take it away when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here. Uh, as the chair mentioned, uh, the report is included in attachment E. It's also online on the Dr. Cause Congestion Management Program page. 2020 was obviously a pretty interesting year for us in terms of traffic congestion, a very unique year. Um, the angle we took for the report this year was to kind of look back at that, uh, see what lessons we kind of could learn from this through uh, what was a big anomaly in terms of our um, roadway congestion. And then look ahead to the future as this is the first year we're also analyzing uh, 2050 as our new horizon year. I'm gonna hand it over to, for the first part of the presentation to Melissa Balding, who's been with our staff in our mobility analytics program for about a year. Uh, so Melissa, take it away. Hello, good morning, everyone. As Robert mentioned, um, we are gonna be talking through what we found in our annual report on traffic congestion. And I hope you all can see my screen and there we go. So for our time together today, we're gonna to focus on several key components of the annual congestion report. Some of them are typical like traffic volumes and VMT year over year. Um, and some of them are atypical um, because we know 2020 was not a typical year. So our topics also include um, the impact of the pandemic and how the pandemic has continued to influence traffic volumes in 2021. And then also how congestion in 2020 shows us the relationship between traffic volume and travel delay, something we got a unique look into given the changes. So we've shared this graph before, showing traffic volumes at a sample location that we believe is representative of the average across the region over the course of 2020. This shows the daily variation influenced by things like holidays and weather events, but most dramatically, this shows the 2020 April pandemic conditions where we see on this average roadway, um, traffic volumes that are typically around 60,000 drop almost down to about 30,000, a 40% reduction. In this graph, we want to show the change in traffic volumes between 2019 and 2020, 
shown as the percentage change on the y-axis. The 0% change line is highlighted in red, and the average across the study stations throughout the region is shown in gray, where we see that dramatic 40 to 50% dip in April, as we probably can all recall the dramatic shift in travel behavior and travel demand. And then we see a slow return to normal through the spring of 2020 to only around 10 or 15 percent below 2019 volumes. And then in the late fall of 2020, as we can remember, probably the changes as cases rose and people's activities changed with more indoor activities. Um, and then the changes in holiday patterns, we saw that dip now back towards that 15 percent to 20 percent reduction. So these are the four locations we're looking at. So the first one, State Highway 470, Northwest Lamorton, and State Highway 285, west of Sheridan, were both pretty close to the average that we saw across the region. Now there was regional variation, and so one example is with yeah. US 36, southeast of McCaslin, below average with close to a 60% drop in April of 2020, and then a sustained 25% decrease, which we believe is because of the higher office commuter concentration, a trip type that sustained a lower um, traffic volume and a more significant decrease throughout the course of 2020. By contrast, I-270 southeast of York had a less significant decrease throughout the year and was basically at 2019 levels in the early fall of 2020. And we believe this is due to the type of trip share on this road, which is more freight and industrial concentration. So those are trip types that didn't feel the same impacts or impacts in the same way. Um, as you can see in your presentation packet, there was also variation in traffic volume change by time of day. You can read more about this in the report, but the big story here is that PM peak traffic returned more readily than AM peak traffic. And this is a trend that is still ongoing in our analysis of 2021 traffic volumes. Every year, we also report on average daily VMT in the region has a total number, which you see on the left side, and then per capita, as you see on the right side. So in 2020, we went from around 84 million total daily VMT to around 70 million, or around a 15% decrease for the year as an average. Per capita, we went from around 25 to 26 VMT per day per capita to around 21 or 22. This uh, includes commercial vehicles and visitors, which brings the VMT per capita up. It also includes non-drivers, kids, et cetera. So that brings the VMT per capita down. So thinking about it per capita, not necessarily just strictly per person. Um, and again, that was around 20, 21 to 22, which is lower than the MetroVision target and um, lower than recent history being even below 2000 levels. VMT on a total daily VMT level was back at levels that we saw most recently between 2005 and 2011 with that 15% decrease. So now we're going to transition to a few observations, congestion numbers, VMT by trip purpose, transit ridership, and traffic crashes. So because of this decreased VMT, we had a lot less congestion. Uh, the 15% reduction in VMT resulted in a 35% decrease in some congestion measures, uh, specifically the measures of daily vehicle hours of delay and the miles of roads in the region that were congested for more than three hours a day. This went from 21% of the roadways being congested for more than three hours a day to only 12% in 2020. And this is because delay decreases more than VMT. It's not a one-to-one -one ratio, and that's a topic we're going to explore um, more a little bit later. And then as all of you probably recall, April 2020 roadways down around 50% VMT, there was virtually no congestion. The types of trips we all took really changed. Um, in the peak of the pandemic, the impact on travel is in uh, illustrated in this graphic here where we saw that near 50% um, reduction. So the first portion of VMT that we want to look at is the non-office worker commute. 
So we lost about half of those trips, half of that BMT. Some of that was due to telework and remote work, but a lot of the non-office decrease was laid off workers, hours reduced, those people not making those commute trips anymore. Then we have the office workers, which again, we saw probably more than half of um, those trips be reduced. And a lot of that was for teleworking. The next category of trip purpose. So this is just typically the types of trips, the VMT we see on the roadway um, kind of falls into this shopping, social, school trips, errands, the times we go have meals and gatherings with friends, everything else. This typically accounts for about half of the VMT in the region. And we see a huge reduction in these types of trips during the peak of the pandemic. So again, about half of those. And then the final category of VMT in the region, um, when we're thinking just typically what makes up VMT in the region, uh, commercial trips. And so there are small commercial vehicles and there are heavy, big heavy duty vehicle trips. And there were certainly changes during the pandemic and the peak of the pandemic. Um, but overall, the net change um, is fairly negligible. Um, some of the changes include how small home personal deliveries increased. Restaurants deliveries, however, would have changed, maybe decreased while grocery stores didn't or even increased. So a fairly steady BMT total for commercial vehicles. So big picture, this is just showing that different trip purposes experience different impacts uh, due to the pandemic and looking at that peak pandemic period, where was the big change? Where, what were the trips that people were no longer making? Shifting to transit ridership, we're familiar with this representation of change as a percent decrease from 2019 to 2020. So we see here where average traffic volumes dipped about 40 to 50% in April, transit ridership decreased nearly 70%, and then continued to hover at about a 65% decrease in transit ridership from 2019 to 2020 for the remainder of the year. We think this is based on personal health concerns around virus transmission and commute tr uh, trip changes, specifically, office workers downtown are still working from home, continued to through 2020, and previously accounted for a really large share of transit ridership in the region. So connecting back to that trip purpose and how we see that flow into other modes as well. And then in gathering our observations, we noticed despite BMT being down, traffic fatalities were sadly nearly the same in the Denver region and higher in the state as a whole. Um, as Dr. Cog partners with different agencies to improve traffic safety across the region, um, and as Jacob was just sharing with how we um, continue to think about how streets can be designed to be safe, the 2020 traffic crash data will continue to be analyzed um, to reduce these numbers, and the relationship to congestion will continue to be a topic of discussion. So as we mentioned, obviously 2020 was a non-typical year. So we know the pandemic's not over. And so the impact on travel behavior and traffic volumes is still ongoing. So normally the annual report on congestion would focus on one year, but this time we have some analysis on 2021 data that we wanna share with you all as well. So in 2021, volumes are starting to come back over the course of the year. So this graph was presented earlier, but now it shows um, a typical seasonal variation and typical day-to-day -day for 2019, the yellow line up here, then 2020 with the dramatic April drop, and then this red line is what we've seen for 2021. So we see the ups and downs, we see the holidays, weather events, et cetera. And then now here we are through August and September, still hovering below 2019 as a typical year, but more traffic out on the roadways on average than the same time period in 2020. An interesting specific location to track as it relates to the pandemic is Pena Boulevard. So the orange line here shows Pena traffic volumes, which we can see in 2021 return to 2019 levels, especially in the end here with this June and July, big jumps up in the Pena Boulevard traffic volumes. Um, and then it's comparing it with on the right-hand side, the Denver International Airport total passengers. 
And so we see these trends track really closely together, the Pena Boulevard traffic and DIA passengers. Um, you can see how dramatic the decrease was in 2020 in kind of the April, May, June, even time frame, um, significant, like hundreds of percentage points down. So this recent jump in June and July, um, coming back into 2019 normal levels. And then finally, um, we once again looked at variations by time of day, continued to see that 2021 is coming close to a normal year, but AM peak volumes remain pretty low. You can see the green line in 2021 overlapping with the 2019 yellow line in the midday and PM, but that gap still existing in the AM peak volumes. So as I introduced 2020 gives us an opportunity to explore that relationship between traffic volumes and travel delay or congestion. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to Robert to present on that relationship and our findings, as well as introduce uh, the new horizon year of 2050 and the congestion into the future. Thank you, Melissa. Mm -hmm. Click forward one more. Uh, so, this graph is illustrating um, you're kind of below that black line is the free flow travel time. That's kind of what would happen if you didn't hit a single red light on your entire trip, but you, you know, it still is going to take you some time. Above that black line in the red area is what we call extra travel time. And that's basically the travel time caused by congestion. So um, as we've kind of hammered home here a bunch in, in April of 2019, that yellow bar you know, during the AMM peak, you'd plan for about 65% extra travel time compared to like the middle of the night, right? In the middle of the night, you're not planning on hitting any congestion. In April and, and July of 2021, we're, you know, about 30% extra travel time. So about half as much extra travel time as before. That's not the same story for midday and afternoon. Um, as you can see in midday, in fact, um, July 2021 was um, on our, on our this is for our, our region's most congested freeways, was actually above the level of extra travel time required during the midday and through April and July, creeping back to what it was in April of 2019, those levels. So again, morning, morning traffic, not as bad as it was back in 2019, but the midday and afternoon traffic is, is getting to just, just about as bad as it was in 2019. Next slide. Uh, we kind of hammer home this nerdy concept, but we've talked about volume to capacity ratio, right? The, the more cars you have on this facility, once you reach its capacity, it just can't handle it anymore. It stops operating, uh, uh, you know, in the way it's supposed to, and so the speed start just plummets down. It's not like it's not like it's a slowly gradual drop. It's like once you reach that capacity point or near it, your speeds just drop. The the road stops operating in the way it's supposed to. Um, so if you if you see like the volume to capacity ratio, as we call it, is uh, in that yellow star there, it's 1.25. That means your speed is really far down. But taking off that 15% um, of volume that we saw in 2020, just taking that 15% on the average off actually increases your speed or decreases the delay by about 43%. So it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, right? So just this is really stressing how important it is through through these continued concepts like teleworking, um, alternate modes, if we just can take off that chunk of volume during those peak periods, you get a really exponentially larger um, decrease in the amount of delay that people experience across the region. So uh, that was a real world thing we saw learned in 2020, you know, a real world um, example of what can happen. Next slide, please. Uh, so enough about the past, let's look to the future here. This is the first time we've examined the 20. 50 horizon year uh, after our plan uh, 2050 MVRTP was adopted in April. Um, I want to stress that this is kind of one scenario of what the future can be. This is kind of uh, the, the, the trend we're on right now. We also did take into account potential changes from the pandemic in our travel modeling. We doubled the amount of, or about a 50% increase, I should say, uh, in the amount of teleworking that we're estimating in our travel model out through the years 2050 partially to reflect a, a trend that's been happening that we've observed through the census, but also obviously that trend has been accelerated. Um, we worked with our federal partners to confirm that that assumption was realistic. With that said, we're still anticipating a large increase in vehicle miles traveled that's mostly driven by population and employment growth in our region, which as you know, is expected to be quite large, over a million more people in this region and 600,000 
more jobs than we currently have. And the same thing that happens when you decrease BMT by a little bit, you get a you know, larger decrease in delay. The opposite is true as well. We're, we're anticipating to increase VMT on our regional roadway system by about 40%. And that is gonna be an exponentially um, larger increase in delay on our region. So huge increases in delay is what we're currently anticipating. Uh, next click. To kind of further illustrate that, um, the model estimates that congestion at 2 p.m. in 2050 will be about as bad as 5 p.m. in 2019. I did forget to mention, we are comparing these to 2019. Comparisons from 2050 to 2020 are a little rough because you know it's such an anomaly. So 2019 is kind of our baseline. We're not suggesting we'll ever return to that, but just to show the, the, the large amount of change that your p.m. rush hour, we're expecting that type of levels of congestion at two o'clock in the afternoon by 2050. Next slide. Uh, included in the report and, and this presentation, um, we we always uh, include this map. It shows the region's most congested roadways. 2019, there was about 1,300 lane miles. Um, about 20% of the CMP system was kind of this, this threshold for us severely congested. Um, in 2050, we expect that to more than double the expanse and the amount of roadways that are that congested. So about 30% or 40% of the CMP, uh, the roadway system, we expect to be congested. So, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to just continue to build roadways, widen roadways. That's not the plan. That's not the thinking, especially in the context of the greenhouse gas rulemaking. So to address the severe congestion we're anticipating, we really have to provide um, options to help people avoid and adapt to congestion, um, teleworking, TDM strategies, uh, alternate modes. Next slide. So, you know, there's, there's always been a lot of uncertainty as a our job looking forward 30 years and trying to estimate what travel will be like through 2050, through 2040, now through 2050. Um, you know, previously, I think some of the hottest topics were these, um, you know, autonomous and connected vehicles, how that, that, that hasn't gone away, right? Scooters, ride hailing services, we, we have a very rapidly evolving transportation system. And if we know one thing is we know that our model is not correct. There is too much uncertainty. The pandemic illustrated how much things can change in the blink of an eye. And disrupt the way we live our lives. Uh, but you know, we have this kind of new set of, of questions. How much of the things that changed during the pandemic, the way that people live their lives in terms of teleworking, in terms of getting things delivered um, rather than going to a store, um, will change. So we have a huge set of questions that we know we can't answer, but we do our best in, in planning to address those. Uh, next slide. Oh yes, we're very excited that um, we we will be with this has been a long-term plan we're a household travel survey so we do one of these about every 10 years um, to estimate travel behavior in the region this informs um, you know what we know about how people travel and, and helps us validate and calibrate our travel models moving into the future because we've had this planned it was supposed to happen in the last year or two but obviously it would not be a valuable use of resources to do this travel survey during a very uh, anomaly of a year but we will be one of the first in the nation to actually complete a household survey in 2022 and 2023, hopefully coming out on the other side of this pandemic. Um, and so we'll have a really good snapshot um, of what people's travel behavior is kind of on the other side of this, uh, this pandemic, we hope. Um, and so with that, I think I'll turn it over if there's any questions. Thank you so much. Um I hope everybody was in, enjoyed the presentation. I know we always enjoy the congestion report, but with the interesting year we had in 2020 and the beginning of 2021, it was exciting to get to see all of that data presented to us. Um, any comments from members or questions? Director Williams. I'm getting there. Takes me a while to get to that button. Um, I just would like for this group in particular to um, think about 30 years ago in terms of telephones and try and imagine what people at the phone company were projecting in terms of usage at that time. And I think that it's directly relevant to our ability to foresee 30 years into the future in terms of um, transportation. I, it's inconceivable to me personally that we will have any congestion of the type that we perceive congestion to be now in 30 years, because I, I just think we're smarter than that. Um, but I just would like everybody to try and hold on to the 
concept that we hopefully are changing. Thanks. Thank you, Director Williams. Director Flynn. Thank you, I'm sure. Uh, Robert, was there any uh, analysis or evaluation on the uh, issue of the traffic fatalities? Uh, when we when we met yesterday internally at Denver, we you know we speculated, of course, that uh, with less congestion in 2020, uh, in some of those months, that speeds were faster, and speed is a factor in fatalities. But I that, that's pure speculation. Did staff look at uh, any accident data or try to draw any conclusions from that? Thank you for the question. You know, unfortunately, we're a little early in, in terms of the way we, excuse me, the timing of when we receive our crash data. In fact, we don't actually have the official total crash data. We only have fatality data. That's the data that's released first. Right. And, and then the details about those crashes, we just don't have it yet. We are keenly interested, especially in the context of the region, region, regional vision zero planning. Um, so we don't have that. We, as soon as we get that data, we're planning on analyzing it. As you've suggested, the leading theory is that there was an increase in um, speeding on the uncongested roadways that led to these fatalities. Thank you. I'll look forward to that because you know that could. This has the potential to sort of readjust our thinking about uh, vision zero approaches. Thanks. Yep. Director Stanton. Uh, thank you, and I want to follow up with uh, what Director Flynn said. I was going to suggest to Robert and Melissa to have for one of those future questions how to improve safety. And I had a chance to look at the fatality figures up through mid-October, thanks to Paul Gisaitis and CDOT. And our fatalities are going the wrong direction. They're up about 8%. Also impaired driving in our region is up 40%. Now that's drunk driving, marijuana, texting, everything else. And I would just say that while we're looking at all these technical things, the idea of how to influence driver behavior, which then influences safety should be key to this. And also wanted to add to what Director Flynn said, we have a net zero program, but it's going obviously in the wrong direction. I don't think we should ever flinch from attacking it frontally. And I think sometimes we keep talking vision zero, vision zero, vision zero, but what are we gonna to do to change the driver behavior that I just mentioned? Thank you, Director Stanton. I think it was rhetorical, so I'm not going to turn it over to staff to answer, but you've put a lot of really good, I mean, those concepts are really important for us to carry forward and figure out how we do direct it head on like you're discussing. Director Cook. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, this is fascinating. It really uh, seems to do important work in terms of not just sort of quantifying what the impacts of the pandemic were, but um, you know, establishing what might be relationships between important factors. Um, so thank you, first of all, I think it's really, uh, really critical stuff. But it is in the same way that you go into 2021 for um, BMT, can, I think there's data available at least partway through the year for transit use. And some, we've seen pretty significant changes in 2021 relative to 2019 and 2020 in the same way that you're seeing some rebounding in the, in, in the highway travel and so forth. Are you all able to incorporate that or is that um, something we can fold in? Um, that's a great point. Um, you know, we're kind of, it's kind of atypical for us to include anything about 2021 and this is the congestion report. So we, you know, as think of it how you will, but this report definitely focuses on roadway congestion. Typically, there are other programs at Dr. Cog um, that, that focus on alternate modes of tra transportation, but um, we could certainly analyze that. We could throw in a slide for the board. They might be interested um, for that. And I, yeah, we did just see that observation uh, recently that 2021 has been a rebound for transit, especially in those peak periods. So good news on that front, yes. Yeah, and, and it differs by quarter. The A-line is you know, I don't know, it's, two, it's at 70, 73% or something like that in July from memory. I'm just going from memory. E-line similarly rebounding. Um, the G-line is at about 50% of what it had been previously in 2019 for the same month. So, but along those same lines, the, the pandemic, um, uh, it seems to me may allow us to tease out relationships between land use and transit use. Um, and in particular, the importance of or impact of activity centers. So I don't know if you're able to, but RTD has um, data that relates to 
uh, station activity. And if you look at that, uh, the during the pandemic with commuter travel stripped away, you could see the impact of activity centers. Um, in I look closely at Old Town, sort of a micro impact, but it's fascinating to me. And I don't know if there is somebody on staff or I just love to carry on a conversation about that stuff. I think it's this is an opportunity to look not just at the importance of trip purpose uh, post pandemic, but also uh, land use associated with uh, transit corridors. So thanks so much for everything. Thanks, Director Cook. Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I certainly agree with, um, with Director Cook's comments with regards to land use and, and the, the interdependency between transportation and land use. I think it's very important for us to get a better understanding of that. And we've done some scenario planning work associated with, which we'd be happy to, um, to uh, uh, share with the, with the RTC. I think we did a presentation some time ago and it might be worth dusting that off to provide some additional detail. I did want to, um, I, you know, the comment I have is, is related to the forecast and the, the, it looks very daunting, right? And, you know, I think it's a quality of life conversation that we need to have in this, in, in, in this, uh, in this region um, and talk about the importance of, as Robert pointed out, the importance of public transportation and other active, active modes of transportation. It's, it's paramount in this region. Um, we can expect people to, um, to leave their automobiles if we don't have the appropriate infrastructure in place for them, uh, particularly on you know, uh, bicycling and, and walking trips, um, that they, you know, we don't create an infrastructure that, um, that they feel safe utilizing. So I think it's very important that we, that we as a region um, uh, you know, figure that out for sure. But I think public transportation, quite frankly, is the key for this region. And, and I know it's not lost on, on Deborah Johnson or anybody on the RTD board that's, that's here presently. So um, I think the conversation that they're having related to the reimagine RTD and thinking about service differently, I think it's very, very important. And I appreciate their efforts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Executive Director. Director Brackey. Good morning. I'm trying to get all of the right buttons on pushed and pushed. Can you hear me okay? We sure can. Great. Um, I want to say thank you for all the work on the report and all of the comments that have been made. Definitely agree with the um, questions and, and concerns around safety and the, the connection with land use and obviously um, transit playing such an important role. Uh, I guess the question I have for Dr. Cogstaff who worked on this, this report is how did the how is the technical work and the forecasting being done in consideration of the context around our regional and state air quality and climate goals? When I saw the slide on the projected increase in VMT and, um, it, and hours of congestion, it just seems very concerning for 2050 when we're trying to get to a different future. So I'm just curious how that work is being done to connect the dots across um, all of this work and how is it able to help provide um, information for us going forward as we're looking at the air quality and GHG piece along with mobility and, and safety. So thank you. Robert. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you, know, you know, as you're aware, Dr. Cog has had a goal to reduce greenhouse gases and improve air quality for well over a decade now. It's something we've strived towards. Uh, the, I think, you know, the principal challenge in this region is the population and employment growth. It, that it's going to, you know, just increase the amount of pressure on our system on, on all modes, transit, uh, transit alike. Um, as you're aware, the, the greenhouse gas rule is still being developed at the state level, and we, we as a staff and, and as the board are keenly interested in how we are going to change the way we do planning in the region to comply with those rules. Um, you know, it's, it's a real challenge to get people out of their vehicles at the end of the day. It's a relatively affordable and convenient way of travel that the majority of high and low income people utilize. Uh, so that, that's going to be a huge challenge to us to, to make those alternate modes more competitive to get people out of those vehicles and, and um, reduce VMT and congestion in this region. Um, Robert, could you just elaborate? I, I don't know if you know off the top of your head, like the percent growth that we're projecting in that period, and could you compare that to the percent VMT growth that you're projecting in that period? It, it's about the same. So we're not we're, we're we're estimating about the same VMT per capita moving into the future. So about it's, we're estimating we hang around that 
23 of VMT per capita moving into the future, which so about a you know, 30 to 40 percent increase in population, about a 30, 40 percent increase in VMT. Thanks for that. Director Brackey, did you have anything else? No, it, it'll just be interesting then to see then how these get adjusted going forward. Either the, what I'm hearing you say is this is the forecast um, without the uh, GHG rule in effect. And um, even though our current air quality goals are still in effect. So this is kind of the without uh, scenario. And then hopefully as we go forward and we have um, other guidance in place, then we could come up with other future forecasts that would factor those those goals in so that it's not just a, a constant increase of, of VMT over time. So it's interesting to me. So thank you. Thanks, Director Brackey. Director Papsdorf. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, really appreciate this conversation. I, I just wanted to sort of tie a couple of pieces together because I think this discussion is really timely. Um, coming on the heels of your recommendation for adoption of the Complete Street Toolkit, work that we've done as a region around a Vision Zero plan. Uh, we adopted an active transportation plan not that long ago and uh, just adopted our 2050 RTP earlier this year. And I think all of these things really come together. And I think for us as staff really paints a picture about you know, while what projects and, and what improvements get made to the transportation system is really important, I think um, I personally and we have a we have a commitment to how we improve, how we develop and and deliver projects. Um, so, what projects and improvements we make is really important, but actually how we design and implement projects is equally as important. And why sort of complete streets and to to Commissioner Stanton's point about safety. You know, if we're gonna if we're gonna continue to make strides in maintaining a reduced vehicle miles traveled and and really make alternative modes a viable option, how we improve the existing infrastructure to adapt to change and encourage change in both behavior and how people move around the region is is really really important. Which is why we're putting such a such a emphasis on street design and facility design and and trying to bring that into our decision making as as local government members and as Dr. Cog when we when we make decisions uh, with you about how to invest limited resources through the Dr. Cog process on not just what projects but how those projects are designed and implemented. Thank you very much, Director Papsdorf. Uh, Director Silverstein. Yes, thank you, and good morning, everyone. And, and excellent work on this report. It's really helpful and. Um, helping us understand where we are today and where we are projected to be in the future with this, you know, huge growth that this region is going to see um, in the number of people, employment, and, and all those metrics. Uh, a couple of, uh, one comment and one question for staff. Um, I believe this data for 2020 and in, even into 2021 really sheds light on the relationship between the pandemic and air quality. For um, this past year, we've had numerous questions at the Regional Air Quality Council that, you know, why is air quality so bad when nobody's driving? And this just shows that everybody is driving. And uh, though traffic did dip at the beginning of the pandemic, it has rebounded. And um, it's not quite at 2019 levels, it seems, but it's, you know, within 10%. So that really illuminates the fact that, um, People are out there. They may not be commuting to work in the traditional way, especially to the, um, the urban centers, but um, they are driving and, and the traffic data and gas sales and, and other, um, uh, other metrics bear that out. So that's just a, a, a point for the group here. But a question for um, staff. When I think of the safety um, aspect of the presentation, uh, we all know that um, you know, enforcement on the roadway of speeding and, and uh, dangerous driving, it seems that it's not what it used to be. And I'm wondering if there are resources through transportation funding that can go to enforcement. You know, we're all talking about reducing uh, fatalities and accidents, but we see just, you know, at least that's my observation and the observation of almost everyone I know that drives uh, that, Drivers are more reckless. The, the speeds are way over the limits all the time. And um, 
there, there are fewer um, enforcement uh, mechanisms out there, whether it's a photo radar or, or speed traps or whatever those things might be. So is there funding available through our, um, you know, through the, the, the revenue streams that come through Dr. Cog and other um, agencies that can be diverted to better um, enforcement at the local level? Director Rieger, looks like you may have an answer to that. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll start an answer and invite others to chime in as well. But just, you know, really appreciate the points made in this conversation around safety. Um, you know, I want to point out that in our Regional Vision Zero work group, you know, when we adopted the Regional Vision Zero plan, it was never meant to be a plan that just sits on the shelf, right? We're very, very focused on implementation and trying to address all of the issues that you all have brought up today related to safety. And specifically in our Regional Vision Zero work group, we've talked about uh, many of these issues around speed and design and enforcement, driver behavior, impaired driving, and other things that you brought up today. In particular, though, to answer Director Silverstein's question, uh, what I can say is that right now, Dr. Cog literally right now is out on the street with a campaign that uh, we call slow speeding, which is the notion that sometimes going even just five or 10 miles over the speed limit, you know, can be really dangerous. And hopefully you all have seen that, some of the billboards and things that are out on the street right now. Um, I also want to give credit to speed, CDOT. Um, in terms of their enforcement campaign, we have worked together with CDOT, with the city of Denver and with others around, you know, sort of the messaging, the campaigns, the education around um, driver behavior, around safety. So um, just, you know, want to make the point that um, that's definitely in our radar screen. I think we're all trying to work together to address some of those issues. They are very complex and they're not easy. Thank you. It looks like um, Director Spots may want to add in as well. Oh, we just got a promotion to director. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Spots, uh, sorry. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I, I just wanted to mention in the context of air quality and, and the pandemic, as Mike mentioned, is the first part of his uh, comment is that, you know, when we are talking about this 10 to 15% decrease that we've kind of sustained through the second half of that year, that's nothing insignificant. That's unprecedented reduction. And we think of, you have, you know, when we're thinking about this in the future of kind of DMT reductions, that's kind of the conversation about how much DMT we'd like to reduce, you know, per capita or as the population is growing into the future. And just think about the ways that we all changed our lives and the, the way that you know our lives have changed that do we is that something we're hoping and wanting to sustain moving to the future and if not how how are we going to you know change other things so that we can maintain that kind of level of decrease that we had for the, the back half of 2020 there so a real challenge i might um turn it to either executive director rex or director papsdorf to try to answer the question around the funding more completely executive director rex Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ron, I'll start. I'm not sure about eligibility of, of funding that we might receive, but it would seem to make sense and is worth checking in on. Um, you know, the, the concept I know in other parts of the country or uh, other parts of the world, like in Australia, I know they have a very, very elaborate um, um, radar kind of remote um, enforcement. Um, I know Paul Josidis is on the line. I know he probably knows a little bit about that. Uh, so, I, yeah, I don't know. You know, quite frankly, if it is, but it sounds like it's something that should be. Let me put it that way. Ron, save me. I, I will. I will look. Enforcement is is an important component, but I guess from my viewpoint, it's not. It's not the solution. And I, I, I want to give an example. Um, there was a street up in kind of the northeast part of the region um, that was two lanes in each direction. Um, a third, a, a, a third lane was added in each direction. Uh, the speed limit was posted at. 40, 40 or 45 miles an hour, and people were consist consistently speeding. And um, so then there was money spent to put one of those sort of um, message signs up that detects the speed on the street and flashes and tells you to slow down if you're exceeding the speed limit. And I would argue that the, the solution to the speeding isn't necessarily more enforcement, it's the design of the street. And if you if you want the speed, if you want people to travel at the speed limit, design the street to reinforce that speed limit, not to accommodate higher speeds. And so I, I again, there is a design element here that, that's really important. We ought to design the streets for the way we act, want them to operate because signage and enforcement is sort of a stopgap solution you can't have a police officer out on every street um, trying to enforce a speed limit or, or safe driving practices. Um, design is a really key part of that. At the same time, we know that enforcement is important. Um, it also comes with some, you know, quite frankly, some 
some potential equity issues that I think are, are a concern and we ought to think about sort of how we deploy um, enforcement in that context as well. So it's a, it's a really complex issue. It's really challenging. Dr. Cog as an agency, um, you know, we don't have funds that really can be used for sort of uh, enforcement pieces, but education and design and, and investments are areas um, that I think Again, our, our Vision Zero safety work group really is trying to dig into these really complex issues, and uh, there, unfortunately, is not one, one simple solution. Thank you. It looks like Director Stewart. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. I, I love this conversation, and I love this report, and I'll tell you why. For many, many years, we've looked at um, how to change people's behavior in order to reduce congestion. And the reason we do that is not because we want to um, change people's behavior to do what we want. The reason we do this is to provide um, safety, um, to improve our air quality, um, to look at the long term. And everything that was said today has to do with the complexity of things. And I'll tell you that one of the most complex things for me as um, someone who is both a CDOT commissioner and also runs a transportation management organization that works very hard to provide strategies uh, to reduce congestion is um, the issue of enforcement. And for I-25, the road from uh, Denver going north up to about Highway 7 uh, has a lot of congestion problems and a lot of safety problems. And part of that is the design of the road when it was built and when it was done, was done in phases. The first phase got done, the second and third phase have not been done on that road. There's no auxiliary lanes and there's no um, climbing lanes to allow enforcement safely to be on that highway. And so people know that they're not gonna be pulled over. When the congestion is very bad from RTD buses trying to, to pick up and move over, trucks coming up from 270, the people behind them get frustrated at the congestion and they move in and out of a managed lane that's not designated to let them do that. And accidents happen north and south every day. And so um, the complexity of this is not lost on me and I think on many of us, um, but I do want to applaud the idea of um, this report and a close look at what we can do to reduce vehicle miles traveled. And I do believe that vehicle miles traveled is a big component in um, if we can reduce that to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions. And um, I know that the greenhouse gas rulemaking group at CDOT has a meeting directly after this to look at the revisions. We heard a lot from people in those nine um, public hearings that we did, over 200 people giving us comments um, that we should also look at vehicle miles traveled. So appreciate this report. It's gonna be good ammunition for me. Thank you. Thank you, Director Stewart. Um, I'll just add my comments in at this point. Um, the, the, the figure, the, the pie chart that was shown uh, that showed the breakdown of VMT by travel type was fascinating to have included. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about how to decrease vehicle miles traveled on uh, required trips or mandatory trips that can't otherwise be taken. And looking at that graph, half of the trips were school trips and discretionary trips. And so thinking, you know, we talk about um, jobs being at, at TOD and housing being at TOD, but if half of the trips are discretionary, we have to figure out how to get people to the things they want to do. Um, so, I mean, I just, I found that figure very interesting because we don't talk about that 50% of the VMT almost ever, at least in the conversations I'm in. We talk about that employment, office employment sector, which was, um, you know, less than a third of, of the thing. So I found that interesting. So thank you very much for putting that in there and it'll, it's food for thought. And the other thing is, you know, we've been talking a lot about how do we reduce VMT? How do we reduce VMT? Um, and we, this data presented a solution for us all, and I hope we all consider it, but it looks like all we need to do is add more holidays. So if we add more holidays, then it looks like we will absolutely, like, matter of fact, reduce VMT um, on an annual basis. So that's what I'll be pushing for, is more holidays, we'll see a VMT reduction, and everyone will be happier. So there you go. Any other comments for the group? 
All right, thank you so much, Robert and staff. A great report as always. And we always love talking about the congestion report and trying to learn from it and understand, but this year it was particularly helpful for us with the you know big changes in 2020. So thank you for that. And so that takes us to our member comments or other matters by members. Any member comments today? Uh, it looks like I have one hand up. Director exec, uh, Director Papsdorf, I'm promoting everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Tolzman. I just wanted to give a quick update to the RTC on a matter from the last meeting. So at the at the last RTC meeting, um, you all recommended approval of a number of amendments to the Transportation Improvement Program. One of those amendments was regarding the funding of a mobility hub in the Castle Rock area of Douglas County. Uh, when, when that package of TIP amendments went to the board, uh, the town of Castle Rock raised some concerns about the selected location for the Castle Rock Mobility Hub. Um, so the board removed that one single item from the TIP amendments. So the rest of the TIP amendments went forward and, and the board asked CDOT and Dr. Cog and Castle Rock to get together to discuss that issue and try to reach a resolution. So uh, with, with good work by CDOT and outreach with Castle Rock, we all got together uh, last week and um, Castle Rock staff, town manager and public works director um, reached an agreement with CDOT about a process to move that forward. So that, that decision won't have to come back to RTC. We will take that back to the board uh, for the board to consider um, uh, taking final action on that one tip amendment. But I think, I thought because of the RTC took action, I, I wanted the RTC to be aware of, of what had happened with the board on that particular recommendation. Thank you for that update. Any other matters by members? All right, our next meeting is November 16th. And we'll see you then. And with that, we're adjourned. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Be safe.